If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm in studio today with our Director of Research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here as well, usual. You and we're doing a continuing series on early Christian church history. This is already show 16 in this long series of early Christian church history, which I think uh, really needs to be covered. Most people have no concept of early church history and uh, of course non-Christians take great advantage of that because most people are ignorant of this subject. Uh, Non-Christians can use the ignorance of people as a uh, weapon to attack them with to try to dislodge their faith in, in uh, the truthfulness of Christianity and try to replace it with their brand of religion whatever it may be whether Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Roman Catholicism or whatever it might be. So with that uh, said, we're going to pick up where we left off from last show here in the 16th episode. Uh, we were basically discuss discussing family and marriage, but we already went through a lot of the doctrine. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. He'll, he'll just briefly review, and then we'll move right into the rest of our material. Go ahead. Okay. Well, just, just briefly recapping what we went last time. Here are uh, 12 doctrines that four or more early church writers affirmed and none denied. Uh, relating to family and marriage, honoring marriage, no divorce except for unfaithfulness, we should be modest and pure, no violent lewd shows, no homosexuality, honor our parents, uh, you know, cherish and nurture our family, you know, having kids is fine, celibacy is better than marriage though, and remarriage is okay after death of a spouse, no incestual relations, and don't love family more than Jesus. And to give you a couple examples uh, of what they said at different points, for three, we should be modest and pure, Tertullian, uh, writing 202-40 AD, has an entire chapter on women's dress, and this is in, in a book with a kind of a different name called On Prayer, uh, chapter 20, page 687. Uh, but he also has an entire book called On the Apparel of Women, and he was, uh, some people would find him somewhat legalistic, and he was against women wearing precious stones, pearls, and little pebbles. Um, so he was kind of against all jewelry for, for Christian women to wear. That's in book 1, chapter 6, page 16 and 17. Another work uh, around the same time called the Octavius, written by uh, Manucius Felix, uh, said that Christians are to stay away from the gladiatorial games and scenic games, which feign lust. So scenic games were like the non-combat games, and they, and they could be theater and plays, or they could be uh, more of a sexual nature, and Christians were supposed to stay away from all of that. Lactanius kind of summed up the, the same sentiment and he wrote around 303, 325 A.D. And he said that the public shows have a more powerful corrupting influence on the mind and ought to be avoided by the wise. Epitome of the Divine Institutes, chapter 62, page 248. He's saying this before television. Yep. He, and he's, he, I don't know what he'd say if he saw television in some movies. <laughs> but anyway, uh, some people calling themselves Christians today would disagree with some of this. Liberal Christians, especially many Episcopalians, believe that homosexuality is okay. Now, many liberal Christians, such as liberal United Methodists, they often do not necessarily believe that homosexuality is okay. Uh, some liberal Christians also believe that premarital sex, if there is some commitment, can be okay. As I mentioned in a previous show, I, when I was a teenager in a liberal United Methodist church, our pastor taught that. So, did they cover all the bases? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot they left out about raising the family that we can see now that we have more time and to peacefully consider it. 
but exactly how to train and train up and discipline your kids at various ages, they really didn't have any teaching on that. Or how to teach financial and other responsibilities to children and how not to spoil your kids. They didn't really say anything about that either. Or how to keep your marriage bond strong with your spouse. They didn't have anything on that. Or is it okay to allow a non-believing spouse to leave? Uh, Paul says so in 1 Corinthians. The early church didn't really address that issue. Or, or how can a husband show respect and care for his wife and express his love? They didn't mention much about that. Or, or how to do marital counseling or balancing purposeful activities in life and the family versus entertaining activities. Uh, some people have said in the West, we are entertaining ourselves to death. Well, they didn't really have that issue as they were trying to run for their lives and stay alive and, and spread the gospel. But they didn't really talk too much about balance there. There's a lot of stuff that some people would think would be church tradition, but it's totally absent from what early Christians knew anything about. Uh, the Holy Spirit leaves the room during marital relations. And that was taught by the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. pre nicene Christians knew nothing about that whatsoever. You could have a marriage, even a lengthy marriage, and then you could annul it. So the Roman Catholic Church does not generally frown on divorce, which is good, but they seem to like they allow annulments. And they had no, they, they didn't play games like that in the early church about annulling a, a marriage. You know, you've been married for 20 years, oh, it's annulled so you can marry again or whatever. Another teaching that was absent was while the priests couldn't marry, they could have sexual partners. And in the Middle Ages, a large number of priests actually, they had a, I guess what we call it, a, a female domestic partner. And they would often be faithful to her and not anybody else, but uh, but the church would perhaps even kill them if they had a marriage. But if they had this, uh, then it was tolerated. And as a matter of fact, um, in Austria and, and Switzerland, around the time of, of the reformers and Zwingli and stuff, the church needed to raise money. And so what they did is they put a tax on the priests that the priests had to, had to pay per child that they had. <laughs> and so they could raise a lot of money that way. All right, so in the interest of appearing more spiritual by, uh, by priests not being married, they basically made a mockery of marriage with that. Also, another thing that was kind of ugly was, uh, what about deserting or abandoning your, your wife to become a monk? There was a, a case written about a monk who was uh, supposedly a very admirable man, and this is after Nicaea, and he abandoned his wife who didn't want him to leave in order to become an, an, a, a monk in the desert in Egypt. And it's like... Well, if that's what spirituality is, that's not the spirituality that, 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 that I'm for. I'm for the spirituality that, that God taught in the Bible. That's right. And, and, abandoning, and abandoning your responsibilities for, you know, is not what God taught us. Well, um, it just shows you, once again, that uh, there's nothing about these things in the, in the early church writings because these things are not biblical. Right, right. <laughs> the, the, the early church writers are going, are basing their beliefs and teachings off the Word of God, the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, the Scriptures, uh, which is given us, given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, and therefore, when you get these extra inventions, these add-ons, these fabrications made by man, uh, you just don't find it in the writings because it wasn't, it didn't come along until much later in time. They never even heard about it, right? So, moving on from governing your family to governing the country. Uh, what, what they had a fair amount to say about the king, the government, and laws. They said we should honor the king uh, or the government. Uh, four writers talked about that, as Romans 13, 1-5 and 1 Peter 2, 17 says. Uh, we should o obey the government, at least when it's not against God. And, and Romans 13, 1-5 mentions that again. As seven writers talked about that. Do not aid in persecuting Christians. If you're a godly person, you're not going to aid wicked people in persecuting godly people. There are nine writers who specifically talked about that. Uh, pay taxes to the government, uh, the, the taxes that are due. Eight writers talked about that. Uh, pray for rulers and those in authority. And at various times, maybe the rulers have needed more prayer than other times. But six writers talked about that. And they would pray that they would have a peaceful reign and wouldn't be persecuting Christians. And, and, pray, and, and But also pray, bless people, or pray for people who persecute you. Emperors, but not only emperors, just anybody who persecutes you. So this is... Kind of a thing that's fairly distinctive about Christianity. Uh, Fourteen writers talked about that, so they were very well aware of that. That when people persecuted them, instead of hating them, instead of trying to get them back or get revenge, uh, they would pray for them, that God would bless them. And actually, the church writer Eusebius reports that sometimes that happens. Some of the Roman soldiers who were guarding the Christians or arresting the Christians, sometimes they 
uh, after seeing the, 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 the faithful testimony of those Christians, some of them became Christians too. Okay? So this is like how to respond to government. Well, in the government though, government officials, if you are a government official, it ought to be just. Eight writers wrote about that. You should disobey or change unjust laws. So things about sacrificing to the emperor or other things that Christians were not to obey. However, because they had a bad law, that doesn't mean they, they could disobey all laws. They only disobeyed the laws that were against God. And the early Christians talked about, quote, legal laws and illegal laws, which was kind of um, illegal laws would be laws against God. So it's, and it was like a pun in Greek. So it was almost mm. like a punning in the face of death to say what they could obey and could. There's a concept that maybe many Christians, at least if you don't live in Rhode Island, uh, mm. might have forgotten about. Mm. Uh, the concept of providence or the, uh, the idea of God governing the world and that nothing in the world happens except what God allows. God didn't necessarily cause everything, he's not the author of evil, but nothing will happen beyond the limits that, that God allows. And 29 writers all wrote about providence. All right, the fact that Christ is a king, or kingdom of Christ, not that he's a, a king of a kingdom in this world, um, but that he, ha he has a heavenly kingdom, uh, 26 writers wrote about that. And that you know, was a very prevalent thing, and especially in the Gospel of Matthew, that we need to remember that we're citizens of a kingdom. Okay? So to give you some examples, for K6, uh, blessing and, and, per, and praying for those who persecute you, in a letter to Diognetus, it says, Christians are reviled, but they bless. They are insulted, and they repay the insult with honor. They are punished as evildoers, but they do good. Chapter 5, page 27. As for K9, about providence, Aristides, who we, don't, we only have a small fragment of what he wrote, but he was a, a very early apolog Greek apologist. He speaks of the providence of God, and says that the mover and controller of the universe is God. This is Apology of Aristides in the early Greek version, chapter 1, page 262. Okay. Well, did they answer all the questions about government and cover all the bases? Well, not really with one voice. The early church disagreed on whether it was okay to serve as a soldier in the Roman army. In general, many of the earlier writers kind of taught no, and many of the later writers taught yes. But don't speak with one voice in that. Uh, what are the best laws for the appropriate punishment for stealing, murder, abortion, or other crimes? They talked about how long people should be a penitents before they'd be allowed to take communion in the church, but they didn't talk about what's the best way for the government to do it, probably because they knew their voice wouldn't be heard anyway, and the, and the emperors were going to do what they want and you know, murder people they want anyway. So they didn't really give a whole lot of thought, like some people gave a whole lot of thought to the American Constitution. Well, the early Christians didn't really think in that way because, you know, they were look like they'd never be a part of the government anyway. Okay, uh, There's a lot that is in, unfortunately, in later church tradition, and it's kind of ugly, that is totally absent in, in the Bible and absent in pre-Nicene church tradition. So it said a ruler can non-violently coerce non-Christians. Uh, Constantine did not, uh, he was the first, at least, allegedly Christian emperor, and um, he closed synagogues and pagan temples to encourage his subjects to go to churches instead. And some people kind of have said, with Constantine's actions, that maybe Christians have more to fear from their supposed friends than from their avowed enemies. So Constantine was not violent about it, but he coerced the non-Christians to come to church. So it's like, and it, a lot of people say Christianity started as an institution, a lot of stuff started going downhill uh, once it was established and once these kind of things happened. Okay, uh, rulers violently persecuting heretics and pagans. There was a heretic, Priscilla, in about 385 A.D., who was uh, killed by the emperor because of heresy. And many Christians uh, thought that was wrong to, to do that. But Augustine, to, uh, un 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 unfortunately, uh, was someone who said that, well, if, if someone could be killed for treason against the emperor, how much more should somebody be punished for treason against God? So Augustine had a very powerful effect on the church. And this is after Nicaea in maybe some positive ways, but one negative way was that, that, that he supported the use of, of torture and execution against heretics. So this is another pretty heavy barnacle that got put on the ship after, after Nicaea. Okay, the Pope officially uh, blessing an invading army. So when the Pope blessed the tanks of Mussolini and blessed the soldiers uh, as they were part of the Axis and invading other countries, that idea of blessing people who were invading the others isn't really present uh, prior to Nicaea. Okay? If the Pope says to massacre her town, then do it. So if there's an Italian town, for example, uh, that was against the 
uh, temporal reign of the kingdom of the Pope, and the Pope tells the soldiers, go kill every man, woman, and child in it, then should a good Catholic living at that time kill all the men, women, and children? I would say someone following God shouldn't. The idea of doing that would be just alien and repugnant and would never even occur to, to an early Christian. But yet, if someone is following who they thought is the vicar of Christ, then I suppose they would have to do that. And so far, and email me if, if you say otherwise, at the website, I have not met a Catholic who says, if I were in the Middle Ages back then and told to do that, I would, as a follower of God, disobey the Pope. And I've never seen teaching about when Catholics are supposed to disobey the Pope, even if the Pope says this. Also, if the Pope says to slaughter Jews, then you should do it. Okay, some of this happened in the Middle Ages too, and it's like, there's nothing about slaughtering Jews or slaughtering anybody else for that matter, uh, prior to Nicaea. It was okay to disobey an excommunicated king. So the Pope excommunicated a king uh, that, well, the early Christians, the, the emperors were pagan idolaters, they persecuted Christians, and yet the Christians still obey the Roman laws when they didn't uh, conflict with God's laws. Likewise, no taxes to excommunicate a king, so if the king wasn't legitimate in the Middle Ages, if he was excommunicated by the Pope, then the people would at least technically not have to pay taxes to them. Okay, uh, there's also other things absent. Uh, you don't see any church leaders uh, planning to kill other church leaders, whether it be uh, an Orthodox emperor trying to kill a Pope in Rome, or whether it be a Pope being a party to killing the previous Pope. You don't see these ugly things prior to Nicaea that basically just eviscerate any authority that they would claim to have, uh, when, uh, that the successor would claim to have when he murders his predecessor. Okay? Destroying Jewish synagogues, uh, you don't see anything about that. Destroying heretical churches or pagan temples, you don't see anything about that until after Nicaea. A crusade against non-Christians, you don't see that, that, that they ought to go wipe out or retake something till you know, you had the crusades in the Holy Lands, you, you had other crusades, smaller crusades against other non-Christians in Northeastern Europe and things like that. But a lot of people don't know that there are a number of crusades against Christians too. So the Pope ordered crusades against the people that are called the Vaudoi or also called Waldenses. Uh, they were in Italy around 1000 AD up to 1400 AD and they didn't really have any beef with the Catholic Church, but they said purgatory and transubstantiation, a lot of stuff, just weren't in the Bible, and so they were just going to quietly be in their rural areas and just follow the Bible. Well, for that, the Pope ordered a crusade to kill them. Okay, uh, also the crusades against Protestants later. But the idea of having crusades against other people isn't really following the Jesus who was the Prince of Peace. And you don't see any idea that this would ever happen in the minds of any Christian writing prior to Nicaea. Likewise, torturing heretics or other non-believers with the Inquisition, uh, with Torquemada and things like that. They say, you know, at least 20, 30,000 people were killed by the Inquisition just in Spain. They had it in other places, in, you know, Italy and, and other places. And it's like, the idea of doing that, that is devilish. You know, just how devilish has somebody got to be before you read what the Bible says about fleeing Babylon. And you don't want to be under the authority of something like that. Okay? An Inquisition would be godly. Um, this was ugly. Yes, it was done in the name of Christ, but then, again, the Gnostics and other people, they did all kinds of things in the name of Christ. And, and, and this has nothing to do with true Christianity, only with Roman Catholicism. So, uh, there, there, there's a lot that they wrote about the government, but there's an awful lot that people might say is a part of church tradition, and sadly I have to concur that it is a part of later church tradition, a very ugly part, but it's not a part of the Bible, not a part of what Jesus taught, and it's not at all a part of uh, what the early church uh, uh, taught and practiced. Very well said. This, uh, this whole idea of the Crusades, and, you know when you're debating, uh, you're trying to evangelize for Christ when you're on a college campus or something, and you've got Muslim uh, students out there or whatever, and they're they're going to argue for Muhammad and their Islamic faith, but one thing they always bring up is the Crusades. What about the Crusades? You know, you, you terrible Christians. And what happens a lot of times, as for me as a Christian evangelist, trying to do, uh, you know, an evangelistic work for Christ, in a in a public forum, I've got to deal with all these these uh, objections that non-believers bring up, particularly from other religions, based on uh, stuff that. A, a church, in this case the Roman Catholic Church, supposedly representing Christianity in the Bible, has done in the past that, as you've just now pointed out, is 
is it, is foreign. very bad. It's foreign. It's alien to the Bible. It's not Christianity. But yet, these Muslims and these other people think it is Christianity. They think that's legitimate Christianity. Because they, for one thing, they're not, they're not real Christians themselves. They don't know what the Bible says. But they have seen, you know, or heard about the Crusades and, and all this other strange stuff that, that the Roman Catholic Church has done over time. The Inquisition, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then they make a big deal about it. And they discount legitimate Christianity on the basis of some fraudulent counterfeit Christianity which Roman Catholicism represents through their crusades, through right. their inquisition, through these things. And so you as a Christian evangelist have to deal with that just so you can try to get them back to the truth of authentic, genuine Christianity. And the early church doesn't know anything about all these Roman Catholic inventions, crusades, and uh, uh, slaughtering people for the Pope's sake, or, or uh, inquisitions, or all the other things you just mentioned, because it's not biblical. It wasn't in the early church. It's something that came along later, and is totally foreign to the Word of God. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Christianity. And the sooner people understand that, the, the sooner they'll be able to discount these arguments that are brought at Christian evangelists, real ones anyway, from all these non-believers who use that as an argument not to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. But with that, let's, uh, with our time rolling, let's keep moving okay. along. I, I, all right, well, just, just a quick answer. When Muslims uh, uh, bring that up, I would say, you mean the Christian jihads? Uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, the Crusades were an evil thing, predominantly, that, that European Christians learned from Muslims as they co conquered by the sword. And, of course, Muhammad... Uh, taught uh, a, a con conquering by the sword and practiced it with surprise attacks and, 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 and everything else. And so Christians, I think, sort of kind of thought, uh, and, and this is wrong, but they thought, well, if they can do it, maybe we should too. But, you know, we, we're not to be like anti-Islam, we're to be pro-God. And whether Muslims do something doesn't make it more right or more wrong. We just want to look at what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. All right, we've got we still got about five minutes left in the show, so let's move on to what we've got next, which looks like, and it's something I was just talking about, when you're an evangelist trying to get out there in the world and preach the gospel so that men's souls might be saved. So uh, take it away, brother. Tell okay. us more about the I, I, evangelism. I, I, all right, well, let's define a couple of terms first. How do people do evangelism? Well, some people have split it up into four categories. And one category is called charismatic evangelism, like charisma, like spirit. And this is like, you know, preach on, brother. You, you know, kind, kind of inspirational, encouraging preaching. Okay, another uh, category of evangelism, or another style, is irenic evangelism. I-R-E-N-I-C. And that comes from the, the Latin root for peace. Sort of a, a peaceful discussion of, of maybe showing from Bible study and things like that. More of a teaching type mm -hmm. of evangelism. Mm -hmm. And another type of evangelism is apologetics and apologetic evangelism, you know, defending the faith and sharing about that. And, and then the fourth type is polemic evangelism. Polemics are like rebuke and more harsh and kind of like a fierce debate, while well, maybe apologetic would be like mild, mild debate and discussion. Now, each of these four categories could be subdivided in each category, actually be two categories, but we're just going to keep, keep it as the four, and we're going to ask a, a pretty fundamental and pretty broad question. If the early church, they turned the Roman Empire upside down in 325 A.D. Uh, by sharing the gospel and that after, within maybe 50 years after that, the majority of the people in the empire would claim to be Christians, at least, um, how did they do it? Which style of evangelism did they use? And the real answer is, they use all the above. Um, and, 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 so we're, and, and now some Christians today, that might be kind of a surprise because some think you should only be one thing. You know, you, should only, you, know, you shouldn't say anything wrong about other beliefs. Despite, I guess, Jesus and Paul and John the Baptist. <laughs> what about their pattern? Are you going to criticize their pattern? Mm -hmm. uh, other Christians, it might be hellfire and brimstone only. Well, Jesus was not hellfire and brimstone with, 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 with the Samaritan woman at the well. Okay, and, and other people may be teaching, like a Nicodemus, more, more, more in, in, in an Irenic evangelism, and then also more of a defending the faith, like in, in, in a public square. Uh, you might think uh, Paul before, you know, Felix and all that. Um, so the type of evangelism kind of varied uh, depending upon the audience and who you're talking to, and we're going to see next um, how the early church um, did evangelism and maybe some of the creative things that they did and, and other things that they did that we might want to consider today. All right. 
Well, uh, we've got less than two minutes to go in this show, and uh, I guess what we're going to do, because we hardly have any time to really uh, get into this evangelism idea, although that was a good framework, and we'll set up the next show in this continuing series on evangelism and move on from there. Uh, but uh, this is the, the conclusion of show number 16 in this continuing series on early Christian church history and the importance of of knowing what the early Christian church believers uh, taught and understood from their knowledge of the Word of God helps us here in the 21st century to understand. And we can also dispel a lot of these, these add-on inventions that people have thrown in along the centuries that have totally uh, created a smokescreen to what the true gospel of Jesus Christ says is related to us through the Word of God. So many people make the mistake of associating these inventions and fabrications that came along later in history with what true Christianity actually teaches. Well, with that, we've got to go. I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Call or write us if you need more information. Join us again next time. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 